Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to come to study your word, to uh, look at what does your word talk about when it comes to us uh, coming together as a body of Christ to accomplish the work of making disciples and, and whether or not church membership is important. And so we pray that as we uh, look at these matters that we would submit ourselves to your word, uh, that you would enlighten us, that you would illuminate the truth of your scriptures to us. And Bless those who are here, those who are still on their way, and those who may be watching uh, online as well. And we thank you, we praise you for this opportunity to look into your word and uh, the privilege it is to study and meditate upon it. And so bless our time now. We submit it to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. All right, so we saw in our last session last week, uh, session 11, that we took a kind of a deep look at our mission is to make disciples, right? Mm -hmm. As individual followers, we're called to make disciples of Jesus. And one of the key things that, if you didn't run away with anything else, is that the call to make disciples is a command. It's not optional. It's a command. So guess what? If it's a command and we're not doing it, guess what? We're sinning. You're in disobedience. If you are not involved in making disciples, you are in disobedience to the Lord Jesus, and we're in sin. That means that we should repent of that and, uh, and ask the Lord to forgive us and endeavor to be in obedience to him instead of to make disciples. So we learn that the process of disciple making involves us going out into the world. We see the call to baptize those who, are, uh, who encounter Christ. Uh, who trusted in him and teach them how to then practice the truth, the fundamental truths of the faith, to walk with Christ. So this lesson, session 12, last time it was we go with Christ. Now it is we go together with Christ, right? So we're going to look at the fact that we all go together with Christ, right? And so our key truth is that Jesus sends us out as a community, right, of disciples in order to make disciples. So he not only sends us out, in a sense, individually, but typically when Jesus sends people out, he always sends them out together, right? He sends us out as a community of disciples 
in order to make disciples. But here's the problem. We all know that there's this, uh, I don't know if you call it a trend or not, that uh, people think that being a part of a local church is really not that important. And, and they think that's optional, right? And so we got a lot of, and so I wanted to read a few things of some of our thinking, uh, some of our wrong thinking, right? And where does this come from, right? Maybe we've been duped by a Western democratic society into viewing churches as voluntary associations. Maybe it's a century worth of practice at being consumers, right? You just church hop, buy what we want. Uh, I'm not sure, but here are some of the symptoms of our wrong thinking. Christians can think it's fine to attend church indefinitely without joining. Christians think of getting baptized apart from joining. Christians take the Lord's Supper without joining. Christians view the Lord's Supper as their own private mystical experience for Christians and not as an activity for church members who are incorporated into body life together. Christians don't integrate their Monday to Saturday lives with the lives of other saints. Christians assume they can make a, per a perpetual habit of being absent from the church's gathering a few Sundays a month or more. Christians, oh, here's a good one. How many, how many of us have been guilty of this? Christians make major life decisions, moving, accepting a promotion, choosing a spouse, so forth, without considering the effects of those decisions on the family of relationships in the church, or without consulting the wisdom of the church's pastors and other members. Christians buy homes or rent apartments with scant regard for how factors such as distance and cost will affect their abilities to serve the, their church. Christians don't realize that they are, they, they are partly responsible for both the spiritual welfare and the physical livelihood of the other members of their church, even members they have not met. When one mourns, one mourns by himself. This is their thinking. When one rejoices, one rejoices by herself. The basic disease behind all these symptoms, the disease which I admit, the author says, courses through my own veins, is the assumption that we have the authority to conduct our Christian lives on our own. We include the church piece when and where we please. So right there, how many of, how many of us, if we be honest, have been guilty of some of that thinking over the years? Yes. Yeah. So it's just quick, like what book is that? Oh, uh, Church Membership, uh, one of the Nine Marks books uh, by Jonathan Lehman. Great little book. Big blue book. It won't take you long to read it. So I would recommend you picking up Church Membership. How the world knows who represents Jesus. Uh, so, so important, right? We don't even, we view it so optional that we don't even consider, like, big decisions. Do I, do I even ask my brothers and sisters, right? Um, do I even consider that taking a job might interfere with my ability, this, this new job, right? Yeah, it makes more money, but I'm going to be working 80 hours, 90 hours a week, and I can't serve in the church. All we think about is money. Or I'm going to move here. But, you know, um, am I going to be able to afford the gas to come to the church, right? Is there a church? How many move and consider the school districts how close the job is, right? But do we even investigate, like, if we were moving to another state, are there any good churches in that area? That's, like, not even in our thinking, right? Because far too often we consider church membership as optional. It's an add-on. But I want us to see tonight that it is extremely important, right? Um, in the introduction in your books on page 162, it says, throughout the New Testament, the worldwide church is described as the body of Christ, right? Every individual disciple of Jesus has been included in that body, along with every local uh, church and congregation. Jesus himself governs and directs the church as his head. Right. That's that's key to remember too. I'm not the head of the, the, this church. Right. Jesus is. Right. So Jesus is the head that directs through His Word how the church is to operate. And nobody, I don't care what title they give themselves, Grand Poobah, Chief Bishop, whatever, 
can uh, ignore the commands of Jesus and the directives to do something different. Interestingly, in the same way that a few basic questions, if you read this section, talk about you know, taking a, having a physical, can help evaluate the physical body, there are key factors that help us evaluate the health and productivity of the church as the body of Christ. As we'll see in this session, we know that the church is healthy when disciples of Jesus do work, do what? Work, work together in a corporate effort to obey him and make more disciples. Now, several years ago, uh, there was a trend in the church to change the terminology of church membership to partnership. Right. Um, I understand a little bit what they were trying to do and what they were getting at is that there's a tendency that people view church membership, uh, the idea of membership to like membership at any type of club. And so, they, you know, when you're a member of a club, you just look for the benefits you get from being a member of that club. And so they were trying to get the idea that you want people not to view themselves as mere recipients, but you want them to partner, right, uh, in, with the efforts of the church. But I never liked that terminology. I never liked that whole change of membership to partnership. Uh, because being a member, a member of a church, is a biblical term. And I think we do disservice when we start changing the terms that the Bible uses. Um, instead of changing it, what should we do? We should teach people the proper view of church membership, right? Um, since the Bible describes the church as the body of Christ, right? Then member is the right term, yeah. right? Because yeah. guess what? My hand does not partner with my body. Right. <laughs> As if it's somehow separate out here, like a floating hand, right? Exactly. I'm going to partner with you, you know. No, my, like it's independent. No, my hand is a member mm -hmm. of my body, right? Mm -hmm. And not only does it receive benefits of being a part of the body, but it also does things to help the entire body, right? right. So as my hand does things, it grasps for stuff, and, and my legs move, and feet do all these things, right? The whole body is now, it is participating, it's doing what it functions to do, right? So, yeah, I don't like the partnership thing. Some people will still kind of use that term. But I think it's biblical to talk about being a member of a church, a member of the body of Christ. And so when we look at Know the Story, which gets us to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the concept of the church existing as the body of Christ can be found throughout the New Testament. That really shouldn't be debated. However, the writings of Apostle Paul offer the deepest and most direct references to that idea, including both how we should understand the body and why it's important for us to do so. So the following passage from 1 Corinthians is a helpful example of Paul's view on the body of Christ. So as you read, pay attention to the strength and confidence of his word. So if I can get somebody to read this section here, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20, and then verse 27. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, is also so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Now you are, now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Yeah, individual members of the body, right? So let's look at that, the one of the questions I asked here. Why is it important? for all disciples of Jesus to understand and apply these verses. Why do you think it's important for us to understand, one, understand what, what Paul is getting at here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and then apply it? Why is that important? I mean, I mean every member is needed. Yes. Every part of the 
body is me. Can't can't do without the one part. Right. So um, I think that's what he's trying to say. You know, within the church, as a body of Christ, everybody's me. Everybody has something to offer. Yep. Absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, my take on it is that not only are we needed, I'll take it back off of what Bobby said. Not only that we need it, but we're all equal. One is not inferior mm -hmm. to the other part. You know, right. like what I'm doing is not more important than what somebody right. else is doing. And, and, uh, nobody's superior. Right. Everybody is on the same equal level. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? I said we ought to, we ought to uh, help strengthen each other mm -hmm. in the word. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Keeps the body going strong. Yeah. So we're all play a role. You know, when Stephen Dunn said that you, if, Here's the idea, right? And, and you, we all know this. If something is not working in your body, your personal body, like it should, you're not functioning at 100% efficiency, right? I mean, it, you know, okay, so some of us, all of us getting older, right? <laughs> by, the, by the second. <laughs> and when something doesn't quite behave like you expect it to do, like when you get up and that knee decides it wants to try to do something different, you know? Well, guess what? You're not walking like, you know, or if your hand decided, you know, have you ever had your hand go to sleep and, and uh, then you try to move it and it's not responding, right? You send in, then the nerves start waking up and that pins it, you know, but it's not, you can't, you won't be able to do, now yeah, you can still lift stuff, you got your other hand, but guess what? You're still not operating at 100%. So when members of the church don't use their gifts, that local church is not operating the way it should be. And as Sister Thorne said, there's no, well, I'm more important than you, right? Because what did Paul say, right? The whole body can't be an ear. Because then, you know, yeah, we can hear you very well, but we can't see a, a thing, right? You can't be one big eye, one big foot, right? We need one another. And even though Paul in other places talk about there's some parts of your body that's more presentable than others and more, you know, there's certain parts that we tend to want to emphasize because they're more visible, like the preaching and the singing, but that doesn't mean that the person who's cleaning the church is any less important. Right? So even though, yeah, that's a more visible gift where you see up front on the stage, but that person who says, I'm going to volunteer my time to make sure that the church is clean and presentable, right? I'm going to teach the children. You may never see me, but I'm going to be in the back teaching. That's important. That role is important. And guess what? We all know that even the smallest thing we, you might consider unimportant, you hit that toe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, nobody hit that toe? Yeah. Yeah. What you do when you hit that toe? Oh, you protect. You, your whole body is messed up, right? It seems like a small thing. Seems like, you know, why do I have these toes? They don't seem to do anything, but guess what? If you hit it, you're going to know it's there, and, and it affects your whole body. So that we need everyone, right, uh, to operate in some form, because the body's going to suffer in some way when parts of it is not doing what it should. Well, Pastor, how do we get that message across? Because gotcha. even right here, we have people who come on Sundays and we don't see them anymore. And it's like, you see people, the other parts of the body get overworked right. and they get yeah. tired. So how Absolutely. do we get the other parts that aren't doing anything to really realize that you are a part of this body and God has gifted you too and you need to be able to help with the body? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that, that is, that's a perpetual problem that the church <laughs> seems to deal with. What were some ideas, you guys, as we're sitting here? Um, you think, how can we engage members, you know, who don't seem to be active um, and involved in the church? Continue praying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Continue praying, right? What else? What are some other things? One thing that can make that is ask them. A lot of yeah. people, they're sure. not going to volunteer to do stuff because right. they may seem inadequate, but if you ask them, can you help do this? They're more likely to do that. Yeah, so engagement, right? Going and specifically saying, hey, I see you, you're a member. We want to, uh, hey, would you join in this? Would you try this out? Would you serve in this? Asking people, engaging them, right? Because some people do sit back, 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they're not that bold to, uh, but you ask them, they're very likely to do that. And, and also, I would say develop relationships, right, with, with people in the church, right? If people feel disconnected, they're not gonna, you know, be more involved, but the more they know, the more we reach out to people. So that means that we gotta make sure that we're meeting other people within the body and not just staying with our own kind of clique or those that we know well, right? It's reaching out, seeing some, oh, that's a new member. So when we present new members up front here at the church, right? They completed new members class. It's not just the, hey, here they are, right? Let's pat ourselves on the back, we got a new member. It is for you to see them Right and say, oh, let me go and introduce myself. Let me see who they are, get to know them. Right, not to say that every new member you want to have a rapport with, but you never know that you can click with someone and then help them. That could be a discipleship opportunity. There we go. Now we're helping yeah. disciple them, right, to grow and saying, ah, oh, we're expecting you to serve, right. So we know, um, you know, as, as Sister Tracy asked, right, what are some things we do? One, keep on praying, keep teaching on it. Keep encouraging, go after people, right? Um, we set the expectation in our new members class, right? That we're we expecting that all members should be active and involved, right? Uh, and then go after the wayward ones that are not, you know, encouraging them, right? To, to get involved and, and let them know. Because some people have really thought that, yeah, I don't have that, my gift is not all that important. And so we have to change their mindset. Say, so your gift is important. I don't care if it's greeting and smiling. Uh, as people come in. That's <clears throat> extremely important, right? Uh, whatever it is, you want to play a role. Uh, don't look down on your gift, right? And thinking that it's not a big deal if I don't show up, right? But we, we got to make sure that we keep preaching, teaching that, showing that. And also, for some of us, it may mean releasing control. You know, because some of us, we get, we get very involved in certain ministries and stuff, and and some of that means we got to step back and let new people come in and get involved. And then we go do other things as well. Not always like, this is my ministry. I've been doing this for 30 years. Well, maybe it's time for somebody else to, <laughs> <laughs> to kind of come on up and, and inject some new blood in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or get someone else involved, right? Um, you know, we don't want to make it a barrier for people who are excited about things. And then when they come into ministry and, you know, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right, you make it difficult uh, or whatever, right? So we want we want to be so yeah, moving out the way, involving people, looking for those and to encourage them to get involved, teaching and discipling. That, so that's part of my, so each of us as members should see that as our mission, right? It's not just well, Pastor, what you gonna do? You know, that's why I asked y'all the question, right? <laughs> <In this case. laughs> what are you going to do, right? What are all of us going to do to help encourage to see those? Because you may have a rapport. You may know this member uh, well. You may know maybe they're struggling going through some things that's preventing them from getting involved right now. And maybe we can step alongside of them and show them that we care. And then when they do go through that season, they'll get involved, right? So what are the things that we can do to reach out to get this message out? Um, that yes, your gift is important. Your involvement is extremely important. Any other thoughts? Any comments? Yes. I was. Um, <clears throat> some, I think uh, one thing that has helped me a lot in dealing, particularly recently, with with the convert that they accepted, has accepted Christ, but they refused. Not so much refused, but hadn't stepped forward to be baptized. Mm -hmm. And so I was working, talking with him, and working with him, and continuing to. Uh, Try to encourage him, but then he was also like that he was running up against other obstacles that were telling him that something different, mm -hmm. someone who was not a mature mm -hmm. uh, person to, to lay out the true mission and understand the baptism and what it was like. Uh, and so I know my, my wife is someone who I've kind of uh, reached out and, at, at a time when there was a, a, a particular need and showed him. I could be there for him, and so it can, so instead of just in that time of need, I managed to continue to do things on a regular basis, like everyday calls. Yes, to, to, to keep in touch, and, and if I don't hear calls mm -hmm. and say I didn't hear from you, uh, you're okay. If they call and check on you, and so we've gotten it down to that, and then so so then I ease back into because right. I'm waiting on you right. to accept to the water. What, you know, what are we going to do? And then he, he said, yeah, I know, I know. He 
I like my pastor, I, you know, I like what the pastor's saying, I'm hearing it, all that, but, you know, I've been told that I, I wasn't ready to be baptized because I'm not ready to join. And I said, well, joining doesn't have anything to do with it. It's still a reason for baptizing. I said, I want you to be baptized. Yeah, because yeah, I said, yeah. I want you to be baptized for me, but I want you to be because you just said you believe you are mm -hmm. right, right. I said, let's fulfill it, the fulfillment. And so, you know, now he's back to, to, to that seed has planted again, so it's mine. And so I'm each time, rather than to just always run it, mm -hmm. cause I'm like, I'm trying to beat it in the right. I just patient, learn to be patient. Yeah, absolutely. And wait until he can say, well, I'm, I think I'm ready. Very good. Yeah. So I'm That's not good. Ready. Thank you, church. That's good. That's good. Right, Eric. Yeah. So I have two thoughts. Um, one thing is that that we are remodeled. Mm -hmm. um, I do personal training and just thinking about how the body functions. Um, I know in the context of the church, it's difficult to show me, and I know pastor, everybody in the, in the ministry, whatever it is, because you also want to be full. There was a, I guess, <laughs> the word for it, I, I feel like a new car smell when that person first showed show up. Right, sure. Everybody, yep. I'm, I'm excited. Right. Other members are excited. We connect, and the people, all people connect with you in the beginning. So, and I think then I got busy. Mm -hmm. Let's take over. Um, the new car smell kind of wears off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah. And we are not, we're not connecting as much. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for me, for both the new convert, the new person, as well as people who are established, Beyond that, and yeah. just connecting. Yeah, that's that good. We are gonna lose that feeling of like you're you're new. Right. Maybe the new person stops showing interest. Mm -hmm. Only on the other side, right. the people we're not co connecting are not connecting with you. So right. there's no necessity to jump over that hump and continue the same uh, building of that relationship right. until maybe a person's old in place. Or I, I don't know what, what goes beyond that, but that's that's the thought yeah, I have in terms of like. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so true because with anything, right? Sometimes you go new and you go into um, uh, as so we're asking. Let's just repeat a little bit. Um, I mean, your points about the the muscle and everything working well together, and how at times when we start a relationship in in a church, right? It is it is very brand new and it's exciting. And then as we get through life, right? Yeah, that new car smell kind of goes away. And we get it caught into either our ruts and our life difficulties and we kind of miss those. And so we do have to be very intentional to maintain that relationship, reach out, right, even on both sides. And I think to help people to not only see church as I'm getting benefit from it, right, it's also I'm contributing, right? Because if, if, we, if we're always consumers, as soon as we feel like we're not getting something, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's exactly, we, we're such a consumeristic, right? And we don't think this is an investment of my life, my time, to pour into others as well as get poor. So, yeah, we're going through a rough patch, right? Think about in marriage. You got the honeymoon, right? You just got married. Hopefully the honeymoon lasts, it's supposed to last for about a couple of years, right? <laughs> sometimes, you know, all right. This ain't no marriage session, but sometimes it's a little shorter than two years, right? And then you get into that rut, that routine, you know, life, difficulty. But guess what? Hopefully, if you got the right idea that marriage is a covenant, 
you don't go, well, this wasn't like when we went to Hawaii, so, you know, I'm out, right? Everything was hunky-dory, but now we're back at home, and you're burning stuff, and, you know, and I can't fix this, and all this stuff is happening in real life, right? We don't just walk out, but we don't treat the church that way either, right? You know, we're very easy, you know, uh, to just get up and, and instead of being saying we're planted, and not only do I receive benefit, but I also give. And it's, a, it's an investment. It's, a, it's almost coveting with that church and membership to say, unless, you know, unless there's false teaching and abuse and stuff going on in the church, I, I need to really have a good reason for leaving, you know, other than moving away and stuff like that, right? But far too often, it just, pastor says something, I didn't agree with that Sunday, I'm out. <laughs> Like instead of coming and talking, let's get some clarification. Right? We just so easy, right? And so I love your point of let's go that extra mile to to, to reach out and reconnect when we do get because that, that that does happen. And we're gonna, you know, every church is going to you're gonna experience that. Yeah, it was exciting at first, everything's new, people are new, and then you get into and then, and then you find out, guess what? Oh, these are human beings, sinners too. <laughs> That's the other thing, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, they're not perfect either, right? Uh -huh. yeah, gosh, right? We told you that. <laughs> so, so and yeah, so there are going to be issues. You're going to get offended. Someone might sin against you. That's why the whole understanding of what it means to be a part of the, the body and not just easily going away. Yeah, you listen to Jesse? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was just going to add on to what Corey mm -hmm. said. But, I mean, this one actually, if you, think, if you think about muscle physiology, yeah. uh, when you go to the gym, if you're lifting like five pounds, you right. use like one muscle group. If you increase the weight to 10 pounds, then your, your, your brain automatically recruits more muscles mm -hmm. as the weight increases. And I feel like for us that weight is like the word of God. I think like reaching out to people, actually continuously teaching the word. Yeah. The Holy Spirit uses that as an opportunity to, to give them that weight of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, a lot of, I, I know when I, when I got converted, I, I did not have a very clear understanding of how important church membership is. And it's like when I started growing the knowledge of the word, I realized, man, this is this is really the life of a Christian. And right. nobody ever told me this. Right. I thought it was just okay. You go to church for Sunday, Bible study on Wednesday, and you move on to other responsibilities right. in life. And right. there's no secular life for a Christian, really. Like your whole life is the church. But I think when you have that information, information out, teaching the word, the Bible studies, and the life groups that we have, where we invite, mm -hmm. you know church members to participate, it, it makes them, it gives them a weight of responsibility that they actually understand yeah. that they're supposed to do it, and mm -hmm. they are, that, that pushes, that urges them to be more active, so I think that's important. That's good, that's good. Now, I think if we make that investment with people, and we set an expectation, because a lot of people, they put the bar very low uh, when it comes, because I guess they, you know, there's been always a drive of, let's get a whole bunch of members, get you know, numbers. Well, the problem is the back door is just as big as the front door, right? And, it, and, and they fear that if we put expectation on members, you're going to lose them, right? But I think when you put expectation on people, hey, you might lose some, but people tend, like you say, if you put that on there and they start to understand the importance of it, people rise to the occasion, right? Uh, I don't think we should weaken that expectation of telling people biblically that they should be involved and should be doing those things. And investing, I love that. How are we going to get people to do that unless we are investing in lives for others, discipleship, and letting them know? So when new people come in or new Christians come in, who's that person to tell them how important church membership is, right? So we need individuals. When we talk about discipling, making disciples, we need some of us who are mature, maybe mature in the faith to start looking out for those younger Christians uh, to help encourage them that they may see, in conjunction with the teaching that goes on in the life of the church, how important uh, church membership, attendance, all those things are, right? Uh, definitely, definitely. So if we look at um, page 164, as we unpack the story, it says, one of the more interesting implications of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12 is that there is no such thing, I love this, there is no such thing as an isolated disciple of Jesus. It's become popular in recent years for people to proclaim their intentions, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus, without connecting themselves to the broader church. According to Paul, however, such a concept is impossible. You don't see anyone in the New Testament becoming a Christian and not being connected to a community of disciples, right? Um, 
To be a disciple of Jesus is to be intricately and intimately involved in the church. The moment we experience salvation, we are grafted into the body of Christ as one of its many parts. So when we're saved, we are put into the, I would say, the universal church, the invisible church, which should also correspond to a, a believer getting connected to a local visible church, right, as an expression of the universal church. Um, you're a part of the body of Christ. That is wonderful news. Because even with the church's past mistakes, because that's the other thing, have you ever heard of that? Well, I don't want to join a church because it's a bunch of hypocrites, right? <laughs> yeah, you would fit right in, come on. Uh, yeah, we're all hypocritical, right? I mean, uh, we're not claiming, I hope no church is claiming to, you know, be perfect. Yeah, church's past mistakes, current faults, Jesus is still the head of the church. The bride is messy, but Christ still loves her, and he's working on her. And one day he shall present the bride without fault or blemish. And praise God for that, right? Because mm -hmm. Jesus is working on us individually and collectively yeah. as the church. Uh, you are part of his body, which means you are intimately connected to him. Now notice this additional promise from God's word. But as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts in the body just as he wanted, right? Not only are you connected with Jesus as part of his body, but you are also positioned in just the right way to accomplish the work to which God has called you. God is the one raising folks in the church the way he wanted them. He's the one, through his Holy Spirit, has given us the gifts that we, the spiritual gifts that we have, right, that as he deemed necessary. I know it's popular to, yeah, we can ask the Lord, Lord, you know, I might want this gift or this gift, but guess what? If the Lord might decide, yeah, I'm not going to give you that gift. Right? I want to teach. Man, I want you to serve. Okay? <laughs> As he determines, you do, you know, you're going to do that, right? Uh, he positions you. You have you have been specifically uh, and specially designed to serve Jesus as a working member of his body. This is the stuff we need to believe and understand and realize, right? Uh, until we do that, then yeah, we might not want to get involved. Many Christians feel uncertain, and this is true, or unsettled about their place in the local church. In their local church, which is understandable given that people, even well meaning disciples of Christ, are perfect. Still, Jesus has promised us a place in his body. Therefore, our service in the church becomes a matter of faith more than comfort. Oh, man. More than comfort, right? It's not about your comfort. It's a matter of faith stepping out and using your abilities and your gifts in the service of God in that local church. So even though, yeah, has God ever called anyone in here to do something that they was outside of their comfort zone? Yes. Well, I'm the only one. No. <laughs> I want to see some hands. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah. There are certain things that we're comfortable with doing, and other times when God, we feel the Spirit is leading us to serve, to do these things, right? And we're like, ah, but it's a matter of faith to serve. All right, so let's get into it. In what ways has God equipped you? Not your neighbor, not the person sitting next to you, but would you like to share in ways that you feel that God has equipped you to serve the church? Well, I'd, like, else, sir. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to do like I do, like I do. Okay. I think he, he equipped me to, uh, like the greeting. Okay. I like that. Yeah. was cleaning the church, would y'all want to come? <laughs> if the bathroom was messed up and the children's area was messed up, <laughs> everybody be watching online. Right? <laughs> trash all up in the front. I gotta <laughs> step around trash to preach. right? <laughs> so they, like, we need those gifts. Certainly. Yeah. Greeting. We need that. All right. Anybody else want to share in ways that you've been equipped to, to serve the church?
blinders away from me so that I'm not, I mean, so that I'm focused on him and not on him. Oh, she does that. Right, that's good. Yeah, I can't. I yeah, right. That's I good. Can't. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. So part of us is, is stop looking at others and comparing yourself because mm -hmm. you know one or two things typically happen when we start doing that. One is we start to feel superior. Yeah. Oh, yeah I, got, I got the gifts. I don't know what they doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up here singing solos and playing instruments and preaching and teaching. Right. This is all right. Or we start to feel inferior. Well, I can't do that. I'm like, well, maybe God hasn't called you to do that. Right. Or if he has, like, there are many of you may have gifts of teaching. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to teach in the capacity of a, as an elder or up front. But God may have called you to teach on a different scale, teach to a different age group. Some are specialized to teach with children, where some of you in here, you would pull your hair out if you stayed in the back too long. <laughs> right? You might stress over your own children. You talk about somebody else's kids, right? Right? You might not be, but, but it's still teaching gifts. But sometimes it can be targeted, right? You do better with this particular age group or with adults. Or, or some of you say, I can't deal with adults, right? I, I, I want to teach with children, right? Uh, you know, so manifestation of that, right, can be different ways. So not looking at someone else going, I can't do that. What has God called me to do? I love that. Anybody else want to share ways that God's quick people? I, I want to mm -hmm. say, um, when working with the kids, I used to always tell them, when they come to their kids, and do something, right. I would always tell them that God only requires you to be the best you can be for today. And you might be able to do better or worse tomorrow, but he only requires you to be the best you can be today. That way someone will pick up the next one. Go ahead. Yeah. It's good. That's so good. I always think about that myself. Too. Yeah. Absolutely. Y'all expect me to do that over there? That ain't what God expect me to do? You're going to be disappointed. God's not. That's good. I like that. Anybody I guess for me, yeah. the gift of organization. Yeah. But it could be overwhelming for some Sure. Just task oriented and stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we have learned to appreciate the gift of us who are not task oriented. Right. I got you. I got you. Well, there is a gift of administration, right? And there are different levels to administration, right? And so, and, and part of that with gifting, too, is um, this is always one of those things because we're sinful. Um, we have to be careful when it comes to our gifts is that we may be passionate about because of we're gifted in a certain area, mm -hmm. and someone else may not show that same passion, mm -hmm. we can't look down on them, right? Mm -hmm. right? Or we can't get upset, or why can't you do this? Well, you've been gifted that way. Yeah. You operate in that. Yeah. Help them as you can, right? So if you are, you know, have a good administrator, task oriented, Somebody else who's a free spirit will <laughs> frustrate you. To look. And a free spirit be like, me? There's all these checklists and stuff I got to do and deadlines, you know. We just need y'all to work together. Give great, you know, or someone who has the gift of, say, helps, you know, and service, right? They just don't understand why people are just not popping up when they say, hey, I need someone to go out and rake the yard and do the. Why aren't everybody just, right, or someone who has a gift of evangelism, very, I mean, we're all called a witness, so that's another thing. Don't think because you not have a gift of, oh, I don't, I don't have a gift of evangelism, so I don't know. You're all called a witness. There's certain levels that we're all called to do, such as witness and giving and having faith. But there are some people who have particular strong gifts in evangelism and giving and faith, right? Uh, and so they look on others, and they, they don't understand, right? So we got to be careful that the gifting that we have, we don't kind of look down on others if they don't share that same passion or zeal for that gift. But that's exactly right. Use that where you see there's a need for it as well. See, administration can be used and, and serving and helps can be used all throughout the church. It's not like well, there's only one position in which this can be used. No, we can use that in any. So if you see a, a, a ministry that's kind of floundering because they need some structure, right? You got too many free spirits in this ministry. Right? You love it. <laughs> But you ain't getting stuff done on time, right? So we need someone with a given administration. And if you got this administrative, everybody's administrative heavy, you know, uh, and yeah, they're getting stuff done, but they ain't having no fun, and there's drudgery, and meetings are, you know, so we need a few free spirits to loosen them up, right? So we're working together, right? We're working together. So that's good. Now, as we think about the body of Christ and us working together, um, what would be hard or impossible for you to do as an individual Christian 
not, not, you know, that's not a member of a church. What would be extremely hard or impossible for you to do as an individual Christian if you're not a part of a, a local church? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. Yeah, I think fellowship. Now you can say, yeah, I can, you know, I gotta find some Christians. I don't even have to be a member of a church of fellowship. But, you know, there's a, um, there's a, a Greek, just I guess your Greek lesson for the name. Uh, the New Testament uses this word, koinonia. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the word in the New Testament for fellowship, and it's not just mere uh, fel- it is deep fellowship. It is a fellowship of of knowing one another, of life together. And I think, yeah, without being a part of a local church, koinonia fellowship would be very hard. Anybody else? Anything else that would be? I say joy, strength, and taking the midst of trials. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I, I had first mind how a Christian can live in the world without uh, receiving comfort, without fellowship, right? Whatsoever goes to church or even to it's, it's just the world can comfort you. Or yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And if you are out there by yourself. Right, and you're gonna go and you're gonna go through life trouble. So don't even talk about if it happens, but when, <laughs> when, when it happens, right? If you have nobody to one fellowship with or encouragement, right? Because you're out there by yourself, and and no one knows you're going through it because you're not a part of a local church, right? You're not involved in anyone to come check on you. So you can be hold up in your house for for weeks, suffering, going through. Nobody's calling, no deacons, no members, because why? You're a lone ranger Christian, and guess what? You're all by yourself. Where's, who's going to encourage you, right? Um, yeah, the Lord, he, but guess what? I think he, that's why he puts us in the body, because he uses people mm-hmm. to encourage. What, what else is, is almost impossible to do by yourself as an individual? I, I'm thinking maybe growth. Yeah. And I say that because, you know, as, a, as being in the body, you can hold each other accountable. Yeah. When we see uh, someone going astray, yeah. we can go love them and encourage that brother yep. and sister. Absolutely. By yourself. Absolutely. Nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Accountability. Mm-hmm. Right? Encouragement, accountability. If you're going astray, church discipline. Mm-hmm. Right? Who has the authority to, uh, to say, sister, you're going to the left, and that's not right? You know, we, we want to, mm-hmm. right? You could be going all left field. And you have nobody to help correct you because you're all by yourself. Someone mentioned online, I think it was Jay, um, interpreting scriptures and properly applying it. You read the Bible, yeah, thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit, but you come up, we should not do theology in isolation. You come up with a thought, you're right, I think this means this. You all are left course, right? And and you, you know, and so now you think, well, this means this. I'm gonna just uh, speak to this mountain and uh, it's got to jump, <laughs> you know, and you don't understand the context and what that means and all of that. Or I'm going to just pray this in Jesus' name, and I'm supposed to get this car, you know. You don't have it. someone else maybe correcting, you know, understanding and keeping things because you have teachers in the church who are charged to do that. Absolutely. So very good. Church accountability, uh, proper application of, of scripture, encouragement, uh, fellowship. What else? Yeah. Wisdom in making godly decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, like in the book of Proverbs, it's in, in the more of counselors, like right. believers, you have you know, God who works for them to give us to, um, to, to, I mean, to give us, to provide us with wisdom in making decisions that we go times to. Absolutely, right? We need one another helping. You know, sometimes we just want the Lord to tell us what we're supposed to do, right? And, and it could be just, you just need wisdom uh, from the Lord and others. Just tell, because sometimes the question might not be between right or wrong. It just might be, what's the best choice I need to make in this situation? Both choices could be morally right. I just need help to discern and think about it. And my brothers and sisters, because sometimes they can see stuff that I, I may not be considering and seeing. Mm-hmm. So seeing what you know, seeing those things. What else? Isn't it somewhat dangerous being out there by yourself? Because in the world in which we live in, there's so many temptations. Yeah. There's so many things that Absolutely. are luring and, and you know that you can find yourself caught up in. Caught up in. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. I think that's a great danger. That's why we all together and having uh, shepherds 
under shepherds in the church, members one another, caring for one another, and saying, hey, what's going on? Well, you know, you didn't got caught up in something. We're praying for you. We're seeking you out and you know, calling you to repentance. But you by yourself, and you can get caught up in there. Right. And then we see, you know, I, don't, absolutely. Um, what about all the commands to love one another? The, the one another's, purge one another, exhort one another, love one another. Can't do that by yourself. Right? <laughs> Can't do one another's by yourself, right? So that's one thing that would be impossible to do. Um, what about using your gifts to upbuild the church? Guess what your gifts are given to? Not to upbuild you. Your gifts, your spiritual gifts are given to, for the upbuilding of the church. And so if you're not, you, you're by yourself, how are you upbuilding the church if you're not a member of a local church? What about right. disciples? Just like, yeah. I mean, you say, I'm discipling someone, but you say go to church. You don't go to church. How are they going to Right. Tell you know, how are you going to tell them the importance of church membership <laughs> or regularly attending worship to be encouraged and you're not doing that? So discipleship becomes a problem. Uh, this question was asked last week, um, what about baptizing and teaching? You know, part of the Great Commission says, if we're going to make disciples, you've got to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, right, to observe everything, right? So, you know, as I think Deacon Forbear said, can I just take folks up to my bathtub and, and baptize them, right? Well, I would say, no, don't do that. <laughs> that baptizing uh, is a church act, right? That the, the, Remember, the keys of the kingdom were first given to the apostles and then to the local church. Right, they have the authority um, to make decisions, binding and loosing, right, especially in church discipline and those things. And they're the ones, the church, led by the elders who affirm who are disciples or not. They they make that affirmation. That's part of what church discipline is. When you're behaving and you don't want to repent, we can no longer say that you are a disciple. We can't point to say point to Bob. No. Bob is a generic person. Not, uh, to Bob. <laughs> and say, you know, Bob is doing this, and it's not right, and we've called him to repent, and he won't repent. He's refusing to repent. He's refusing it right. We can no longer point to Bob and say, this is what a Christian looks like. So that's why we break fellowship. That's the church's responsibility to do that, right? And when we baptize someone, it's the church affirming that this person has intention to follow the Lord. So you can't do this individually with no witnesses and, and the church kind of visibly there to make some type of affirmation. Mm -hmm. So that's why you can't even fulfill the Great Commission when it, on that part if you're not a member of the local church. What about branding? Mm -hmm. The mere fact branding. You know, like if people, uh, you're branded as a Christian. Uh -huh. you know, the label yeah. uh, can protect you because you know, some people have a, a large degree of respect for people who are Christian and won't cuss a lot, won't, okay. won't do this. But I'm thinking in terms of, you know, if you're in the church and people know that you're very active and you're involved, mm -hmm. then it's, I don't know, I just look at it as a form of branding, like we always, in today's language, in terms of identifying. Okay, that's what you're saying, right. So being a part of that, you identify with God's people, and you will have a segment of, you will still have some segment of people who respect that. <laughs> Nowadays, though, it's, it's kind of it's kind of going away, right? People just say, hey, you're Christian, I don't care. You know, they do whatever they want to do, right? But, but yeah, there was a time when people respected, even if they didn't believe it. They, you know, they wouldn't do certain things on the church ground. They say, hey, this is a church. But now, you know, it's, you know, the respect for that is really going down. Yeah, I also wonder, you know, about how do we you know, talk to the person who's not the one, and you know, they give the argument, and I guess I'm so you're also positioned in just the right way to accomplish the work which God has called you. You know, and, and, you know listen to that, I said about different ways, you talked about the different ways, the Christian description you gave in the book, mm -hmm. which uh, every place else within that book is what we call non-believers, okay, all people. Did those things, and then you know we got the person out there by himself, and I, I wanted to say we can't really achieve faith uh, because if they have faith, then they'll say this is what God wanted me to be. Okay. Okay. So, which I don't believe is the true meaning of what we're trying to, you know, say here. What, what he's trying to say there about we're right where we want to be, where he wants us to be. We're right where we, he wants us to be a member of the body. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you're out there by yourself, and I guess you know, I've been by myself a lot. Okay, and I know one of the 
excuses. You know, you just like God is everywhere. Right, right, right. Things right. you talked about about right. the Christian. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't go to church. Right, right. God's everywhere. That's so right. he was with me. Okay. Right, right. I'm alone. God was with me. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, I don't pray in public. He said, you know, hey, you go to pray in private. Close the door. <laughs> okay. So you have all these things. The, the dilemma uh, for whatever for Christians making disciples and making them aware of the body is making them see how the faith, the one thing that you truly can't have is you're out there by yourself. And you can profess it. And you can even argue it. Mm -hmm. Like I have done mm -hmm. many times. You know, I got argument right here. Says, That's right where God wanted me to be. And you just read. <laughs> right. Okay. But do you have the true faith? Right, right. Out there by yourself. But what we get from yeah. what I got, my own yeah. personal thing. Yeah. You know, come and hear. You know, as all the folks from Mount Zion. Okay. Uh, especially Willie preaching it. <laughs> okay. Was that the, what the body offers you? Right. You know, is the true faith. And that's something that you really can't get if you're out there by yourself. Absolutely, yeah. And then when people make those excuses, like you said, it really is excuses to say, well, God, you know, this is where God wants me to be back out here at home by myself and stuff. And you got to kind of really have to challenge folks on that and say, you know what, God never contradicts himself, right? So this word says you need to be regularly assimilating. I don't believe that whatever spirit told you to stay at home, you know, and not be a member was really from God, right? Because mm -hmm. people do apply that in all different cases. And you hear except sometimes so-called Christians say, well, you know, God told me to, you know, uh, to divorce my wife, you know, because she, you know, can't cook, um, you know, instead of buying her lessons. So he just told me that, you know, I feel the Lord. No, he didn't tell you that. How do I know he didn't tell you that? Because the word tells me that, and God doesn't contradict his word, right? And that's why I'm saying that. Right, right, my, right. My gifts need to be articulated yeah, yeah, yeah. things very well. Yeah. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I've listened to all these things you're talking about, and I've, I've used them. i got right. a new one now. <laughs> the right, God is the right place to accomplish the work that God wants me to do. That's right. what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. do what you do. That's, 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 that's the, right. The faith thing, I think, is, is yeah, really and important. And it's very key. Absolutely, absolutely. Very good. All right, as we look at um, on page 165, it talks about we work together to make disciples. Um, it says there's no question that being part of the church, both in the local congregation and the smaller groups, right, provide a number of benefits. So we do get benefits from being a part of a church. We can find community, friendship in the church, for example. You can find support and encouragement. We talked about that, right? We find education, transformational teaching. All of these are wonderful blessings. But we must always remember that the body of Christ wasn't designed solely to bless the members of that body. Rather, the church exists to accomplish the will of its head, right, which is Christ, and it is Christ's will for the church to make disciples. So we look at back at the early uh, church, for example, if I could get somebody to read that real quick, Acts 2, 41 through 47. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through, through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Yeah. All right. So how do these verses show obedience to the Great Commission? How do we see uh, obedience or the fulfillment of parts of the Great Commission uh, in, the, in this scripture text? They were baptized. Baptized, right? So, all right, he told her, yeah, Great Commission says you got to go out and baptize, but there were people getting baptized. What else? They uh, held to the apostles' teaching. Yeah, they were teaching, right? Remember, the Great Commission says we need to be teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, everything Jesus has told us, we're supposed to teach. So we got teaching, baptism, teaching. What else? They were, they were evangelizing and discipleship. Okay. Because every day there were new ones being added to their number. Mm hmm Absolutely. So you see them having a positive witness, right, through their efforts uh, in the community because people were, God was saving folks, using their witness, right? People were coming in, right? 
So the, the watching community came in faith as a result because of their positive witness. <coughs> Anything else? It gave us that belonging and uh, earthly belongings to share with, us, with everyone. Yeah, with so, everyone. so now we see a good deep fellowship among one another that if someone had a need, they were not without, you know, they, they were willing to say, I'm gonna sell this to help you out in need. Not, not the whole idea of, hey man, you just need to get a job, you know, I got mine, you get yours, right? No, we, we are a community, a body, right? Caring for one another. So, so even in the early church, we see baptism, we see the teaching, we see the positive witness they have, they enjoy the favor of the people, we see that kind of evangelism, people getting added to their number, deep fellowship, all of that is taking place in order to make disciples. That's why we need one another. So as we consider what it means for us to make disciples, do not think you can do it outside of the context of a local church. That's why being a member of a local church is so important. And I hope that you know through this you'll be able to uh, kind of articulate it there even when you run into those people that have that objection. Like, I don't need to be a member of a church and all that kind of stuff. Try to let them know there's some things that you cannot do, you will not be able to accomplish outside of being a member of a local church. Now, before we get, um, before we get, I know we're about at eight right now, um, to turn to 166 and engage. Um, it is reality, right? It says, it's not always easy for people to work well with others, right? I mean, we, we know that's true. I mean, that happens with every church. Even among disciples of Jesus, it be difficult to set aside our own egos and agendas in order to function as a team. So we're trying to make disciples, but we spend far too much time bickering in the ministry meeting uh, about stuff, right? We need to be making sure that we're working together so that we can actually make disciples. For that reason, it's important for the members of your group to be intentional about finding ways to strive for unity together. So if we're going to make disciples as a church, we need to be unified. Fortunately, one of the simplest methods for strengthening the bonds within your group is also one of the most effective. That method is prayer. Right. Right. When you and your group members join together to intercede for one another in the presence of God's spirit, you will experience greater unity. You will develop deeper levels of trust, encouragement, and appreciation. So I would encourage you, if you guys are, are in ministry meetings and y'all get together and y'all not praying, <laughs> start praying. Right. Pray at your ministry meetings. Right. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Um, so, as a way as we kind of exit out um, at your table or someone can kind of fill in if we need to, just let's pray for one another, as it says, right? As a group, spend several minutes sharing about issues or circumstances for which you like prayer. Then pray for one another out loud, um, just within your, at your tables. Um, and, you know, like it says, as each group member prays, the other should focus mentally at his or her to God. And then we're going to conclude, uh, conclude by committing to pray daily for one another by name. So, yeah, kind of make note of who's at your tables or who's in your prayer group. And just pray for one another throughout the week, right? So I think if we can start praying for each need, it's hard to stay, I think we talked about this in one of the Bible study, hard to stay mad at somebody and hate them when you're actually praying for them. And I'm talking about... I'm talking about good prayers, not, Lord, get them prayers, not, you know, <laughs> smite them, Lord. No, not that kind of prayer, but genuine, Lord, help them through this problem. Help them through this situation. So let's take about, uh, maybe about five minutes real quick, share real quick, and that means quick prayers are enjoyable to give everyone an opportunity. So short prayers, don't have to be real long, but share real quick uh, some prayer requests and make your prayer requests short, not long. And we'll let you guys pray. And I'll close this up at the end. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Start praying. I would start praying. Father, we thank you for just your many blessings. We thank you for our time as we prayed and 
I pray for every group, Lord, as they have shared requests with one another and pray that we would pray for one another throughout this week, uh, that we would be concerned about one another. We are, we are the body of Christ. We are a local church here, and we thank you that you have placed us in this body, uh, not only to receive benefits, but also to give of our time and our talents and our resources and our gifts for the upbuilding of the church so that the church can accomplish the mission that you have called us to, and that is to make disciples. So God, thank you for saving us. Thank you for Jesus who died for our sins, and thank you for placing us in a body so that then we can use our gifts for the upbuilding of your kingdom. So God, even as we leave this place, our place, we pray for every request that's going on. We pray for every request that was shared at each table. We ask that you would meet every need according to your will, that you would be glorified in all things. Until we gather again, we give your name all the honor and all the praise and all the glory. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Bless you guys.